to get the hot air out of you. Because God knows when he puts you in the fire, you're going to pop. And you'll be another statistic. You can't preach this in 30 minutes. He wants us to get out the air bubbles of bitterness, of lust, of hate, of crazy thoughts. Whoop! Our problem is we can't stand the process. Only the men and women who can stand this process will come out pure. Amen. But after he gets through whopping, 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 then they throw you, they throw this clay into the water. Gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. The thing's drowning. Oh, oh God, I didn't. I didn't come to college to be in the water. I didn't follow you to be whopped. I was on the wheel. Sunday morning would come. I'm in the middle of thousands of people that are barefooted all over. That's why the charismatic movement today is not producing great preachers. It's because they've taken the whop out of it. Oh, you don't whop people, you love them. You can love a piece of hunk of clay till you die and it'll never get the bubbles out of them. Only one thing will get the bubbles out of them, whop. That's, that's the only thing that'll get the bubbles out of you. Then after the cleansing, they, they put that clay in the water to cleanse it of impurities and to soften it. And I'm going to tell you, you, can, you will never be a great preacher until you've learned to weep over lost humanity. That wheel is what God wanted Jeremiah to see. He said, that wheel is the circumstances that you will find yourself in in life. You'll be on the wheel of loneliness. But I got news for you. Every man that God calls, he puts on the wheel. And if you, can't st if you get off the wheel before time, You'll always go through life crippled. And the problem we're facing today are young men and young women that want to get off the wheel. They don't want to pay the price. Sometimes of loneliness, sometimes of being set apart. I remember how many times, 700 miles in the interior of Africa, sun beating down 120 degrees, I haven't had anything to green to eat for six months. I have visions of going home, putting salt on the lawn and eating it. <laughs> Woo! I said to my wife one day, if I ever see a pile of grass, I'll put oil and vinegar on it and salt and I'll eat it. I don't know what a clothesline preacher would do with them, but I was on the wheel, and, 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 and I would hear my boy ringing the old iron wheel that we had up there for a church bell. We didn't have any organ and no carpet. We walked on mud. We went in mud. We sat on mud. We looked like mud. In those years, I had a big beard. 
because riding those motorcycles in, the, in that terrible humidity, zero, and your face had cracked open and bleed, so we all had to wear beards. God, we were a woolly-looking bunch. And I used to dream of home because before I went to Africa, I was pastor of a beautiful church and had a beautiful radio broadcast that went out to two million people. And I drove a new car every year, and I lived in an eight-room house furnished from top to bottom. And when I walked down the street in the morning, I was Reverend Greenaway. Yes, sir. How do you do, Reverend? And now I'm among a bunch of precious souls for whom Christ died. Naked, hear the beat of a thousand tom-toms, hear the screams at night from savage breasts, and you're lonely. And that's where a lot of young missionaries quit. They couldn't stay on the wheel. Dear God, young people, get it out of your head that, that, that anything you've been through, it's worth it. It's the experience that puts iron in your soul and fire in your bones. You should never be heard saying, why? Why? If you want to say why, ask yourself, why did he die for me? Why did he call me? Amen? Why did he allow me to preach his sacred word? Friends, listen. Listen, young people. He has called you. He loves you enough to place his hand on you. And you are chosen. God have mercy, man. You're chosen. You're sacred in his sight. He loves you. He didn't bring you this far for you to wind up in a pile of wise. He's still God, still in his holy place. Stay on the wheel. It says in, in, in the Old Testament that God sent a man by the name of Joseph. Joseph, who was Joseph? I'll tell you who he was. One of the greatest crimes a family ever committed was perpetrated against Joseph. Joseph denied by his brethren. Sent into Egypt. Tempted like no man has ever been tempted. Lied about. Joseph. Now he's in prison. He's on the wheel. He's on the wheel. God is making a vessel that he's going to use. He's on the wheel. But in the end, Joseph fed not just his family, he fed nations. And the question this morning is, who will you wind up feeding? Will we feed on our own ego, our own talents, and our own goodness? None of us are good this morning. We are here because he is good. Amen? Oh, hallelujah, he is good. He is good, hallelujah. Say it. Say it again. He is. he is good. I'm not good. He is. But I ask you this morning, after you've been chosen and put on the wheel and in the fire, who will you feed? How many will you feed the word of life? I thank God that as rough as I was when he called me full of the devil, sinful, fighter, angry with the world. But he saved me. 
and filled me with his Holy Spirit and broke my heart. Put me on the wheel. Put me in the oven. And then one day he led me to the hungry. And I have fed thousands and thousands and thousands the word of life. Amen. You got to make up your mind what you want to do this morning. I was talking to a missionary in Fall River, Massachusetts a little while ago and he was telling me he was in South Africa in Angola where they're, st where they're starving to death like flies, where men and women are crawling. They can't walk anymore. He said, I was going to this village and I, there was a truck ahead of me that had 5,000 pounds, no, he said five tons of grain headed for that village. And he said, I got around him. I wanted to get to that village before the truck got there. I wanted to see the smiles. I wanted to see the happiness of the people as for the first time in months and months, they're going to have some real food. And he said, I got into the village, the truck came. He said, there was almost a silence in that city. He said, I watched the men unload the grain and put it in the warehouse. No one seemed to be real happy. And he said, I saw the town elders in the circle like they do. And he said, I went over to them. And I said, aren't you men happy for this grain, they said, oh, yes, Pastor, we're, we're happy for the grain. We're thankful. Well, he said, but the old man, the chief said, but, sir, he said, we have to make a decision. And my friend said, but, sir, what decision you have to make? Bring it out. Open the sacks. Feed them. Let them eat. He said, sir, that's the decision that we have to make. Are we going to open those sacks and eat that grain and be full for a day or two or two weeks? Or are we going to take that grain and plant it? that will bring forth a harvest that will keep us living for several years. We all have to make the same decision. Are we going to take what God has given us and just enjoy it for a season? Or are we going to take our lives and plant it so that someday there will be a harvest where even millions will live because you made the right decision. I don't care who you are this morning. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your background is. Mister, we're all in the same boat. We are here to bear witness of him. We are here to plant the seed that someday there will be a harvest. Are you with me? Then they're taken out. You know, the alarmist, the alarmist says, nothing can be done. In this many people, you have alarmists that say, nothing can be done. Then you have the isolationist that says, forget it. In a crowd like this, you have isolationists. You have alarmists. You have fatalists. In a crowd like this, you've got so many fatalists. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. When I was saved, my God, there was more alarmists around me. They didn't believe I could get saved. They thought I came into church that night to raise Cain. And they all went home. Thank God. Because when they walked out, Jesus walked in and saved me. There was the isolationists around me that, 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 that were saying, leave them alone. Men laughed at me. 
preachers. Every one of them had to listen to me preach before they died. Amen? Because I stayed on the wheel. I got all the hot air whopped out of me. And I stayed on the wheel. My advice to you this morning is stay on the wheel. Yeah. After they take that clay, wash it, whop it, put it on the wheel, then the vessel is put in the oven. Hey, you're not over yet. And from the wheel, you're in the fire. Oh, God, I thought there was enough. Lord, help me. I've been through enough. Not until he says so. It's like the ball player yelling as he crossed home plate, I'm safe! And the umpire said, look, Mac, you ain't nothing until I say so. And we ain't nothing until he says so. Amen. Amen. And in that oven, in that furnace, I've watched them. They, not one piece, one vessel can touch another one. Because if, if two vessels touch one another, they're fused and, and the vessels are ruined. There's a separation in the oven, in the fire. God uses fire to separate us. Amen? God uses fire to separate the men from the boys. God uses fire to cleanse and make us strong. Amen? That's what fire is for. And there must be a separation in your life. I remember the day when I started to preach. One of the great, one of our great doctrines was separation. Separate yourselves from the world. Separate yourselves from the things that will destroy you. And we were separated. They threw rocks at us, and they they tore up our tents, and and they tried to drive horses in the in the church, and they threw rotten eggs and tomatoes at us. You say that's because you were dumb. No. God, I could have whipped. I remember one night to try to drive a horse in our little old hole in this church, and we had a man there who worked in the slaughterhouse. He was a calf hammer. He killed ca cattle all day with a hammer. Whop! Next one, whop! And he would come to Wednesday night service, and he didn't have time to take his hip boots off he wore, and he rolled them down, you know. He didn't smell like Chanel number no. 5, and he would... He would walk in, he would, I can see him now coming into church, you know, with those big hip boots on. Oh, he was, he was tough. And I remember that night that the preachers, that, that we were about halfway through the message when some boys, young boys, tried to drive a horse in. And I remember, he, Brother Godin, I remember his name, he jumped up and he said, I'll go out there and calf hammer that whole bunch. And I was right behind him. Let's have it. Ah, give, it give it to him. When the preacher burst our bubble and said, now, Brother Godin, sit down. God doesn't do things like that. And I was deflated. We were in the fire. And in the fire, you have the feeling sometimes that nobody understands you because you're separated. I don't care who understands me. I understand him. Amen? I don't spend my time wondering what people think of me. I know what they think of me. That I can't preach 30 minutes. They don't want me to get in front of you because they know I'm going to take my time. That's what they do. They sing their songs. Everybody gets up and preaches a little. And I say, take your time. That's what I'm going to do. Listen, friends, there's not another vessel beside you that can take you out of the fire. The potter takes you out. He puts you in. He'll take you out. Amen? Daddy can't do it, Mama can't do it, 
The professor can't do it, and I can't do it, but he can do it. Amen. And when we're ready, stay on the wheel. Don't knock the separation of the oven. I, I remember in Switzerland one time, I was climbing a mountain, if you can imagine me climbing mountains. John Kosky would have been proud of me on those days. Oh, he would have been proud of me. But I reached a valley where some of the most hardy people in the world live. And I was walking with an old Swiss man. I always pick the old man because they're a little slower. I hope you can say like I can. I can say like Paul. I was young, now I'm old. I can say that because I'm still alive. Half of my friends are dead. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And I, we, on the way up, we pass by a cemetery. I mean, my father, of all the places, hanging on the side of the Alps, was a cemetery. Old, old, old. And I went over, and I was reading some of the headstones. I love to read headstones. I, 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 when I was pastor in Boston in 1939, I used to go and into the old cemeteries. And I, I saw two brothers buried one day, and one of them had on his tombstone, here I lie snug as a bug in a rug. And his brother who died later had his tombstone made, and on his tombstone it said, here I lie snugger than the other bugger. But anyway, <laughs> I, was, I was reading, I was reading these tombstones and one of them said gave the man's name and it said he died climbing he died climbing what an epitaph what what eulogy what could be said of you at the end of your life? He died climbing. Amen? He died climbing. I'm going to have to stop. All I'm asking you this morning is, are you still climbing? Or have you leveled off? Moses climbed one last time, but when he got to the top, he saw his glory. Amen. I look for a city whose builder and maker is God. Amen. I'm climbing. Hallelujah. I'm on my way home. You see, I will be around to see you in your glory. I won't be around years from now if Jesus tarries, when, when you are preaching great sermons and people are coming to the altar and you're, 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 you're sowing seed, I won't see you when you have your harvest. You see, you young people have had a long look at my life. But I won't have a look at your life. But I am glad this morning that I can stand here and say, if you've looked at my life, you have seen the grace of God and what he can do for a dirty hunk of clay. You can look at me And see what the power of God can do 
and the, and, and, and the goodness of God. See, you've had a long look at my 53 years of preaching. I won't have that privilege with you. I've pretty much lived my life. I'm not dead yet. I'll preach until I die. You see, the strong years of my life are behind me. But I can stand here this morning and say to you, I thank God he got a hold of me when I was strong. And I gave him my strength. Can I stand here this morning, young people, to say, I've never been sorry. If I had my life to live over again, I wouldn't change five minutes of it. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, Brother Greenaway, how do you feel about Baton Rouge? I said, like I always have. God called me here four years ago. And I've been faithful. I've been loyal. And I will be. I've never run from a battle in my life. If my 53 years mean anything to you, stay on the wheel, stay in the fire. You see, my life has been touched by men who gave their lives. You know, we, we read a lot and we read poetry and we sing songs about people that have given their lives. But see, I worked with the men and the women that gave their lives. And how many times I thought it was the end for me. Like in 1946 when I was dying with Blackwater fever in a little place called Ten Kudugu in Burkini Faso, you, won't, you don't even have any idea where it is. For some time, six months at a time, we never saw another white person, another missionary. And I remember the day that I came in on my bicycle and the bicycle fell, actually, I just fell. And I realized that I had black water fever because I knew the symptoms. I had buried too many. I had seen too many of our missionaries die. And they carried me in the house a little mud house. And put me on a bed where two weeks later I was still in that bed. Only now I was in the last stages of, the, of black water fever that killed 126 missionaries that I know of. I buried three of my buddies Power, and I thought the angels are coming to take me home. When it dawned on me, the skin was coming off of me, dehydrated. I had screamed till I couldn't scream anymore. There was no medicine, no doctors. And I remember the that afternoon when I called my wife and said, Mary, this is the end. Because my blood was leaving my body. And she sat on the bed holding our little girl who is now 44 years old. And the tears streaming down her face, she said, Charles, we've cast our bread on the waters. We've done everything God told us to do. It'll come back. When I heard 
When she said that, I heard voices singing, Pong bay zin, zin, win um biga zin. Ponga bay, ponga bay, there is power. That angels don't sing, there's power in the blood. That's my song. Amen. Amen. That's my song. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Angels were created. I'm redeemed. And I rolled over and looked out through a hole in that old mud house, and I saw them coming. Who were they? Oh, there was hundreds of them. They were the bread that we had cast on the water. They were those that had been healed when we laid our hands on them. They were, they were those that were saved out of the deepest anism, paganism, heathenism. Here they came. They heard I was dying and came. Some of them walked 125 miles. The tom-toms were beat. They walked into that compound and got around that house. Joined hands. They didn't look like much. Filed teeth, hair sticking up, great travel marking. Some of them naked. But they were the bread. They were the seed that we had planted. And now the harvest, hallelujah. Amen, because we had stayed on the wheel and in the fire. About 15 of those young men came into that house and gathered around that bed, got on their knees, put their faces on that old dirt floor, back to back men. Men that had been full of the devil men that had been leaders in their heathen worship are now tears are flowing and forming pools on that old mud floor and they're boring a hole straight through to heaven and God smells the sweet incense of their prayer leans out over the portals of glory said it's green away <laughs> yeah that's him And he says to the angel, hand me the balm that flowed in Gilead. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Give me any time the balm that flowed in Gilead. And he stretched forth his hand out over the glory world above, out over the portals of glory and poured it out. I've learned, mister, that when God Almighty stretches forth his hand to me, hell can't hold him back. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the power and the glory. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He is the power and the glory. Woo! And that came down through that roof and flowed over my body like liquid gold. And when it did, I was H-E-A-L-D, healed. I was healed. <laughs> and if I was healed, I got out of bed. I said, if I'm healed, I got to act like it. So I got out. And I staggered outside. And when they saw me, a roar went up to heaven. The tom-toms beat until you could feel the ground tremble. I just hope, I just hope that God will allow some of you to see what I've seen. <laughs> that crowd got so noisy. They didn't have classes for three days. <laughs> the whole town came. Then the next town came, and the next town. It went on for three days and three nights. People were healed, filled with the Spirit, saved. Hallelujah, by the end of the third day, they forgot what started the whole thing. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Stay on the wheel. Let me tell you this, and I'm going to let you go. In the early 50s, my wife and I had come 2,000 miles across Africa in the rainy season 
across rivers with, on dugout canoes lashed together, you pull a five-ton truck up on them, buddy. You've got to have, have more than reason. You've got to have faith. Pull up. Get out in the middle of the river. Your crew wants to jump. They're scared. They're screaming. You grab one. You grab another. You threaten them. Just they don't you jump. A pound you in the ground. Because you know if they if they jump into that river, they're gone. There's alligators. Whoop, whoop. You get across, and then you've got to go back and get the Jeep and the trailer. That takes guts. But I'm I'm here to tell you that you can bring the third vehicle across singing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. Hallelujah. And we got to Senegal, the first missionaries that ever was allowed into Senegal of any kind, 99% Muslim. And we built the first church and raised the first cross. Through much pain, But I remember one day, I got a call, a radio call from Dakar. And it was from young Robert Carell, a surgeon, a young surgeon. He said, I need to see you. I said, what are you doing in Dakar? He said, I have come to work for Jesus. I said, Robert, there's a lot of places you could have gone as a surgeon. He said, God called me here. He said, I want to see you. And I remember going all the way into Dakar, what, four or five hundred kilometers. We were sitting in a little room, and he said this to me. Now, here's this brilliant young surgeon, graduated the top of his classes in every university he attended, including his medical school. He said, Brother Greenaway, when when I was a child and we gathered around in the living room to have family altar, he said, I would lay my hands on the old organ stool. And I said, God, other men have given you their feet, There's, but I'm giving you my hands. I'm going to be a surgeon. Bless him. And the day that he graduated from, from his internship, a full-fledged sur surgeon with offers from the finest hospitals across America. He said, Brother Greenaway, I, I never forgot the day that I said, God, here's my hand, until the day I looked down at the same hands that were now trained surgeon hands. He said, God, the offer still holds. Amen, nothing's changed. My hands are still your hands. Can you say that this morning? God, my strength is your strength. My future is your future. My potential is your potential. Take me, break me, mold me, shake me, do what you want to with me, but oh God, use me. You see, the important thing in your life right now ought to be, God, use me. It shouldn't be taken up with a thousand other things. God, use me. And he said, Brother Greenaway, I love you. I've heard you preach. I know I've followed your missionary career. But I said, Doc, look, I'm just a missionary. I'm not a surgeon. I can understand why I'm here. But he said, I'm here. He insisted. Here. He insisted. He said, I want, he said, I'm going to spend one year in this hospital in Dakar learning the French language and learning the French methods of medicine. And he worked in that filthy hospital. I'd go in to see him covered with filth and dirt. That was the filthiest thing I had ever smelled in my life. And that boy, that young, brilliant surgeon spent one year in that place. God forsaken place. In that filth and in that Listen, mister, I have seen the greats. 
I know what God can do for you. But I also know what you can do to yourself if you take yourself out of his hands. He's still the master potter that can make you the vessel he wants. I said, all right, Doc, I'm going to tell you. There's a ridge down here about 80 miles long where there's 100,000 people that have never heard of Jesus. I said, it's rough, Doc. It's cut off six months out of the year. He said, I'll go. It wasn't at the end of the year, a couple days later. I heard a truck out in my compound and went out, and young Dr. Carell climbed out of that truck. His father had told me, had written me and said, Brother Greenaway, don't allow my boy to do anything with his hands. He's, they are surgeon's hands. If his hands get hurt, he's whipped. And here was this boy, young, brilliant surgeon, crawling out of an old truck on his way down to that ridge. We spent a couple of happy days together because I loved him. And I remember that day when he and his wife, who was a nurse and two beautiful little girls, left our compound and headed for the unknown. We prayed for him. My wife and I, we spent a lot of time praying for Robert and his wife. And one day, the commandant sent a planton with a message to me and said, Mr. Greenaway, come down to my office immediately. And I went, rushed down. And that commandant was weeping. He was an ungodly man, but he was weeping. He said, Mr. Greenaway, I just got a radio out of the place where your colleague has gone, and they say that last night he was siphoning gas out of a truck to put in his pickup to go out in the mountain to help a woman that was dying, and, and he got his mouth full of gas and spit it out on a pressure lantern. And it exploded and burned the truck, burned him until when I saw him, he was cooked. Those hands were melted. We couldn't get there by vehicle. And the commandant said, they want you to bring in some blood plasma. So we went and got it and flew over in our little plane and I saw that little wife of his out there with a bed sheet. There were three huts. And those two little girls standing beside her and she was waving the bed sheet where we were supposed to drop it. And we flew over and dropped it. Flew on back to Tambacunda and waited. And the word came out each day that he was getting worse, that he was dying. And finally, we talked the French military into bringing in a helicopter from Dakar. And they went in there and brought him out in a basket on the side. And I'll never forget. <laughs> I kneeled down and opened that basket. And I saw my friend cooked. You could see he was cracked open like a frankfurter. You could see his insides. But he was still alive. And I said, Doc, it's me. How are you? And he whispered, praise the Lord. We took him on and then and flew, flew him on into Bamako, the capital of the Sudan, then Mali now. Put him in a hospital. He lived 
that afternoon. But somewhere he summoned strength and he called. And we gathered around the doctors and the nurses. And somewhere he got enough strength to say, I came to Africa to give my life. I didn't know it would be so short. But he said, I'm glad I came. And he died. I'm going to tell you young people something. I've lived too many years with reality, with experience, to let anything throw me. No wonder Paul said, none of these things move me. God help you this morning to let the right things move you. We took him out and buried him in the sand. like I had several times before. And I was walking back with a French colonel in the French Foreign Legion, hard-bitten man, born, grew up on that desert, killed more men than he could count. We were walking along, and he said, Mr. Greenaway, I don't believe in God. I don't believe. in what you believe. He said, if there's a God, why did, did God allow that precious young, brilliant surgeon to die like a dog in this forsaken place? Why? I said, I don't know. I couldn't answer him. And we walked on, and just before we were to part, he took me by the arm. And in that hard bitten colonel, there was a tear rolled down his face. He said, let me tell you, Mr. Greenaway, before you go. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, if I ever find a God, I want a God like that boy had. Because he said, no man would do what that boy did and die like he died unless he had a God that he knew. He said, when I, he said, I hope I find a God someday like that. What will people say at the end of your life? Boys, listen, girls, you've got to think of down the road. You can't allow the present time to destroy you. You've got to think down the road. What will people say? I'm not afraid of dying. The older I get, and sometimes I could care less. I love my children, my grandchildren. There's a lot of things I'd like to see. I'd like to hang around and see God use you. But I'm not dumb. I've got sense enough to know, man, you don't live forever. What will men say? On your epitaph or on your tombstone will they put, he died climbing. He died winning souls. Any of you want to come down here this morning and tell God about it and ask God to help you? Anybody here?
<laughs> oh God! <laughs> oh God! Oh God. <laughs> God, oh God, oh God. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Wrap your arms around them this morning. Wrap your arms around them this morning, oh God. Oh God. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh Lamb of God, oh Lamb of God, oh Lamb of God. Please, Father, lay your hand upon these precious people. God, take them, fill them, mold them, shape them. God, until they come off the wheel and out of the oven. Vessels, vessels, vessels that the Master can use that will pour out Oh, God, the water of life on the desert of thirsty millions. Wonderful, wonderful Christ. For in thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Father, there is nothing good in us. Nothing. Nothing nothing in our hands we bring this morning oh lamb of god nothing in our hands we bring but only to thy cross we cling Lord, I dedicate, I consecrate my life anew and afresh. O oh, King of kings and Lord of lords, Master, 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 Master. O oh, Father, O oh, Father, 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 Father. Father, Father, thine is a kingdom the power and the glory. Sing it. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, all fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, the living God, Father, press on me. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yes. 
Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, spirit. Oh, 